All right, hello everyone. My name is Sarah. Um, I'm the technical support for this uh, session. Um, on our slide here, we have our moderator and our presenters. Um, so we we'll just have this slide and then we have a slide after this um, stating just some housekeeping things. Um, and then after that, we'll just go right into our presentation. So first, um, Shade, our moderator is going to start. Thanks, Sarah. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Policy and Possibility, uh, our last breakout session for, for today, but I can promise you it will be um, a good, lively discussion. We have two wonderful presenters. Uh, before I get to some details about them, I just want to share a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the session is 50 minutes long. Uh, the last 10 minutes will be Q&A uh, format, so you can put any questions into the chat throughout the session. Um, I'll keep an eye on that. Um, and uh, we'll share those at the end. Uh, we uh, recommend that you keep your, your cameras off and your mics muted. Um, again, if you wanna leave your camera on, that's great as well. At the end, we will have the uh, CE surveys in the chat as well. Sarah will post those as we get towards the end of the session. If you have any issues completing those, they will be emailed to you within 24 hours, uh, but please make sure that you stay through the session to complete those. Um, Again, we've got two wonderful speakers uh, for the session today. If you were here for the plenary this morning, you already heard Dr. Brand, uh, but I will share a little bit of a bio of both Dr. Brand and Dr. Geierman, and then we'll turn it over to them for their, their presentations and then discussion. D Dr. Marsha Brand is the Senior Advisor to the DentaQuest Partnership for Oral Health Advancement and a consultant on matters related to access to oral and rural health care. From 2009 to 2015, she was the Deputy Administrator of the Health Resource and Services Administration, um, or HRSA, an agency within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that works to fill the gaps for people who live outside the economic and medical mainstream. Previously, she directed HRSA's Bureau of Health Professions, where she provided national leadership uh, in the development, distribution, and retention of a diverse health workforce. She earned a doctoral degree in higher education from the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's and master's degree in dental hygiene from Old Dominion University. Uh, her partner in the session today is Dr. Steve Geierman. Uh, Dr. Geierman is a retired captain in the U.S. Public Health Service. He is the senior manager addressing access, community oral health infrastructure, and capacity within the American Dental Association. He served as a dental director in the Indian Health Service and federally qualified health centers, as well as being a Health Resource and Services Administration regional dental consultant and project officer within the National Health Service Corps and the HIV AIDS Bureau. Previously on the board of directors of the National Network for Oral Health Access, he currently serves on the boards of the American Institute of Dental Public Health and the Organization for Safety, Asepsis and Prevention, as well as the Oral Health Progress and Equity Network. Um, in my role at Zufall, I'm the uh, foundation director and I oversee all of our uh, policy and advocacy and government relations efforts, as well as other external affairs. So I'm thrilled to, to be your moderator today, and I will turn it over to Dr. Brandt, who's going to start the presentation. Good morning. Or good afternoon, I guess. <laughs> um, great to be with you all today. So much uh, Great content. I've been uh, on the sh on the, um, the call, all of the presentations today, and got to hear some really great content. And we're hopeful to add to that. Um, it's my privilege to do this work with Steve Geierman. I am a, a great fan of Steve. He's a terrific colleague and partner. And we're going to be talking about policy and possibility in rural oral health. Next slide. We don't have any conflicts of interest. Next slide. And these are our objectives for our session. Um, we want to learn about opportunities to advance rural and oral health policy and legislation um, and uh, how they've been impacted by the outcomes of the November elections. We're going to talk about how to engage federal agencies to advance rural and oral health 
Health. And then we're going to be looking at the evolving role of community health workers and some of the policy and payment changes that support their work in oral health care. For those of you who were um, on this morning, a little bit of this is uh, a do-over uh, because Sam had asked me if I would present it uh, as part of the plenary this morning, but there's also new content here for you as well. Next slide. Okay, so here we have the White House. Um, and I think uh, it's still a little bit uh, of work to be done to call this, but next slide. Um, what are the incoming uh, administration's key transition priorities? And these are articulated on the website that the um, Vice President and President-elect Biden has created. Um, they are addressing the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, economic recovery for those places that have been significantly impacted by the pandemic, um, racial equity. It's been a very difficult year for many folks in, in our country. Um, and so how can we address that challenge? And certainly climate change is one of the priorities for the incoming administration. Next slide. Mm -hmm. These are some of the other priorities that one can find on the uh, <clears throat> transition and health policy teams sites. So these are some of the things that the Biden administration would like to address. Certainly uh, improvements to the Affordable Care Act, uh, Medicaid funding and guidance, health care uh, and the safety net, and in particular looking at rural hospital closures. This has been significantly uh, a significant problem for small rural hospitals. Um, the administration would be strong advocate for FQHCs, certainly is interested in serving our um, tribal populations through IHS and has been specifically looking at workforce challenges. And so uh, those are some of the priorities along with telehealth and broadband. We learned a whole lot about how we might use telehealth more effectively these past eight months or so, um, and certainly uh, in support of our rural communities. Uh, and the campaign has also talked about addressing health disparities and prescription drug policies. Next slide. So, <clears throat> Who are we going to be working with? This is the question. Uh, the Senate remains uh, Republican. Uh, every state has rural regions, however, and so even New Jersey. So we'll want to work with the, the Senate. Um, we want to work with new and returning senators and those folks who serve on the committees of jurisdiction, which is congressional slang for the committees that are responsible for this bucket of work. Um, and certainly we'll want to um, seek champions. So can you reach out to Cory Booker or Bob Menendez and see what their interests might be around rural oral health for New Jersey? Um, the House maintains a Democratic majority, but not very, by very much. And here again, we want to be working with new unreturning members and those who serve on the committees of jurisdiction and we'll be seeking champions. So working with the Congress will be important for advancing rural oral health. Um, in the states, um, in the states, there's a bit of a, a disparate um, numbers. The, there are 27 Republican governors and 23 Democratic ones. There are 61 uh, bodies in the legislatures that are controlled by Republicans and 36 by Democrats. Um, so uh, here again, you would want to meet with new and returning legislators about rural and oral health and be looking for those champions. Okay. And these are some of the issues we would want to watch for their potential to impact rural and oral health. And these are um, across the White House, the Congress and state governments. Um, we have been thinking that there was a possibility that the ACA uh, would be repealed. It's less looking less likely that that's going to happen. Um, probably more information in June as the Supreme Court takes this up again. We were hopeful that um, COVID relief legislation would get uh, finished in the lame duck. Certainly that's important to rural and oral health communities preserving access to care. Um, hasn't seen anything move on that today. Uh, so we'll see, see what happens going forward and next year as well. 
Certainly, some of the issues to watch in the states are the state budget crises. Uh, a number of the states were significantly impacted by the COVID pandemic um, and tax revenue went down significantly, but some seem to be doing better than we had anticipated. And certainly <clears throat> we will want to look at what happens to Medicaid in the states uh, in these difficult times. And also the extent to which we can promote maintenance of effort in Medicaid um, and perhaps uh, take a look at those pesky work requirements and see if we can get those overturned. Other legislation that we may see uh, could address Medicare or Medicaid, um, healthcare, and the appropriations process. And some there's some possible areas for compromise in the legislatures around appropriations. Um, certainly there's been some work in maternal health and this talk of addressing drug pricing and surprise medical bills. So those are some of the things that might happen in the White House, the Congress, and the state governments. So let's talk about how one engages <clears throat> the federal agencies to advance rural and oral health. Um, specific to rural oral health, these are some of the things that we might engage an incoming administration around. Um, looking at establishing a Medicare dental benefit in Part B, we know folks in rural communities tend to be older. Um, even just exploring that to get the CMS to take a look at what it would cost, how difficult uh, would it be? Um, can we look at medically necessary um, Medicare and what um, what we could fund? That something could probably be done through regulation rather than any kind of legislation. Certainly, as I said before, we want to preserve and expand uh, Medicaid adult dental benefits. Our rural folks um, tend to be uh, a little have lower incomes and more likely to be on Medicaid in many of our regions. Another opportunity would be to take a look at expanding the uh, dental coverage for non-disabled vets that the VA offers. Right now, what's offered is very, very limited. You have to be basically 100% service uh, related disability or having been a, have been a prisoner of war to get <clears throat> VA dental coverage. So that's an opportunity to talk with the new administration about. You know, ACA, some of those achievements, what can we build on there? Um, addressing those pandemic related challenges that uh, have been disrupting access to safe quality dental care. How can we you know, going forward and preserve access to emergency care, but also the, the regular care that folks need to have to preserve their oral health. Um, whatever we can do to support the integration of oral health into overall health increases the number of dental providers in a way, because if you can get primary care providers to take responsibility for the oral health of their patients, then you expand the, the workforce who's taking a, a look at that issue. Um, and certainly uh, health centers have been a significant leader in this area in the integration of oral health into overall health. Um, and then telehealth and other access strategies, that, the extent to which we could get the new incoming administration to promote those. Next slide. So a little bit more of the what uh, advocates can do to impact existing or incoming uh, administrations, oral health uh, and rural health policies. Um, engage the, the, the leadership and provide them information. You know, one of the things you might say is, is this is an opportunity for you to serve as a champion for oral health. And we really need those oral and rural health champions. So you could engage at the regional office level. You've got, um, you're in region two. So can you engage um, the folks there? See what's happening in your region. Uh, Tanya Raggio was on the call this morning. She's, she'd be a good connection. Uh, looking at the administration for children and families and particularly how we can use Head Start to advance oral health. Um, looking at the needs of older adults and people with disabilities by engaging the administration for community living, CDC, certainly division of oral health and all of the data collection that they do. Engaging CMS, CMS has a, has a, a, a or has a dental officer now, and that's great. Uh, how can we work with them around Medicaid, CHIP, Medicare, uh, the Center for Innovation, and what could we look at, get them to look at related to improving access to oral health care in rural communities? And certainly we need all the data that they can share with us. Similarly, NIH encouraging them to look at rural oral health and collect data. Um, we could engage uh, the Indian Health Service around 
oral health, and particularly uh, as they provide care across this nation to uh, tribal populations. And they've had a really effective Early Childhood Carries Collaborative. That's a good model that we would want, certainly want to promote. And then having spent about 21 years there, I'm particularly fond of the Health Resources and Services Administration. They support a lot of activities related to um, oral health and rural health. So they support the community health centers, the workforce programs are there, the National Health Service Corps and maternal and child health programs, uh, the HIV and AIDS programs. The Ryan White, um, turns out the Ryan White program is going to be 30 years old this year. And I was on the Senate floor as a staffer the day that it passed. And his mom, Ryan White's mom was in the gallery. So that was kind of exciting. Um, HRSA is the part of the uh, department that does the health professions shortage areas. And certainly we know that many of the oral health shortage areas are in rural communities. And HRSA also is engaged in um, research and data collection. So let's talk a little bit about how. <clears throat> you know, how, how am I going to, are these people going to pay any attention to me? You know, how did I make this go? So you would want to work within your organization and perhaps get other collaborators who have similar views. So maybe that's your state oral health coalition or your state rural health association and see which agencies you might want to target and what you might want to ask them to do. And it may just be that you all you want to do is share information, but is there an ask? You know, is there something you might ask that agency to do? And so you're going to have to have sort of a team to help you prepare for this. Um, and then figure out who in the leadership at HHS you want to meet with. And sometimes that's a little bit daunting. Um, but if you go to the org charts and sort of work, work your way through, you can figure it out. And then how do you get a meeting with an agency official? So the best way to do it is call the office where that person works and ask the scheduler, you know, the person who answers the phone like, hey, you know, I'd like, I'd like to talk to Dr. Brand, um, the deputy at HRSA. You know, how do I get uh, how do I get a meeting with her? And that individual will say will say, well, send us a letter or send an email to this or please call this number. So it's it's not too complicated, but you're going to have to ask. Um, you're going to also have to be prepared to explain why this person would want to talk to you. Like, what is it that you're doing that would be of interest to this individual? So if you were going to talk to the folks at um CDC, you might say, you know, we have an innovative new program that's uh, collecting data in the state of New Jersey, and we would like to share this with you. Um, just know now that most of these meetings will be virtual for a while going forward, um, but they could be in person. Most of, um, most of the DC HHS offices are in the Washington area. Um, CDC struck out on its own, and they're mostly in Atlanta, but they've got a DC presence too. And a couple other things I would suggest that you do um, have a no longer than two page send ahead and or leave behind and it needs to be well referenced and it needs to be referenced with citations that the feds would recognize. So the Congressional Budget Office or something that um, NIH has done or CDC is something that uh, pro provides them um, reassurance that you know, this is uh, this is a solid group and they, I'm going to want to talk to these folks, you know. And then the other questions you need to be prepared for is this question of like, who's going to be against this? You know, because they're going to want to know that. who's Who doesn't think it's a good idea to have a carries collaborative? Who doesn't think it's a good idea to expand um, Medicare for, you know, adults, uh, seniors. And so be prepared to answer those questions. And the other question that you'll always get if you're um, engaging the federal folks is, you know, how much is this going to cost? <laughs> and where is this money going to come from? So um, those are the sort of the tips for engaging the administration around rural and or oral health. So, all righty. Um, so because, you know, uh, I worked there for so long, I thought I'd use HRSA as a place to start uh, as examining how one would engage. And certainly they have a broad portfolio of um, rural and oral health programs. So you might go to the agency administrator. Um, there will be an acting one for some period of time. The deputy usually steps in to be the um, acting. Um, the 
of the agency administrator is a political appointee. So it would be you know, January, February, perhaps before they get a, another one in place that doesn't require Senate confirmation. Uh, and this individual is responsible for the entire $11 billion agency. So a really broad span of control. Um, the associate administrator for the Bureau of primary health care manages all of the health center programs. One thing to know is there's really broad partisan support for FQHCs and they're kind of everywhere. Um, so we have rural sites and they do provide oral uh, health care. Um, and it's the site for a lot of the primary care and dental integration. So that's a great place to go uh, and talk about some of the interests that you might have. Um, the Bureau of Health Workforce has an associate administrator also. All the oral health workforce programs, loan repayment, um, health professions shortage designation, the workforce research programs are managed out of the health <coughs> Bureau of Health Workforce. So if you're looking at expanding the health workforce or you know you you think that um, New Jersey uh, needs to be more successful in seeking grants to do this kind of um, work. So you'd go talk to the folks in the Bureau of Health Workforce. And then every state has a maternal and child health Title V grant, and it's all managed through the Maternal and Child Health Bureau. Um, and certainly they do a lot of work around uh, prenatal care, and that would be of interest too for those of us who are seeking to improve oral health outcomes for moms and babies. The HIV and AIDS Bureau uh, manages all of those Ryan White programs and does um, provide dental services. So what's happening in your state, you know, and or um, how might you work more effectively with uh, the current grantees. And then um, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy is the department's Office of Rural Health, but they had to put it somewhere. So it sits in HRSA. Um, they make grants, you know, and HRSA makes a lot of grants. And so it made sense to put them in the Park Lawn Building with the rest of HRSA. But it's the department's lead for rural health. Um, has a pretty significant portfolio of grants. Uh, they might want to take a look at um, the other thing that it does is it reviews all of HHS's proposed regulations for their impact on rural providers and you know, trying to keep the department from shooting itself in its rural foot when it does things um, and also supports a, a significant research portfolio. So, you know, you could go to HRSA. That might be someplace if you're looking to engage the administration. You know, using those tips I suggested, you know, see if you can get in and talk to someone about issues that uh, you see in your state related to rural oral health. And if you decide you're going to do it, give me a buzz or send me an email and I'll help you because I know the inside story. <laughs> um, and just a couple of other things I would share with you. Um, there is, uh, as we know, uh, coming soon, a Surgeon General's Oral Health Report. You know, take a look at those recommendations and see if any of them are things that you would be supportive of going forward. Um, and you could engage a new and or returning uh, you know, uh, Surgeon General about that. Um, certainly, um, it's been a while since there's been a, uh, an HHS Oral Health Strategic Plan. So perhaps we could work with Rural Morix and other folks in the Oral Health Coordinating Committee to get a new one up and running. Take a look at the president's budget. That tells you what the president cares about. And then also to see what the uh, Congress is making, making available for health centers, the workforce programs, CDC, et cetera. So work that appropriation side. The, appropri the authorization is the legislation says you can do it. The appropriation says, and here's the money. So that step is really important too. I think too, going into this new administration would be really important to engage uh, the assistant secretary or whomever is directing the Office of Minority Health because we know that we need to take a look at rural oral health through an equity lens. And then the last thing I would suggest is that you think about how you can engage community-based care. The incoming administration is really excited about community health workers, talked a lot about it um, in their transition papers and in, on their workforce uh, and policy group. And I'm gonna to toss it to Steve now as soon as my contact information is up there because he's gonna talk about community health centers. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Brand, so much. And we'll, we'll come back to questions for both Dr. Brand and Dr. Geierman at the end. So we'll, we'll turn it over to Dr. Geierman now. Thank you. All right, Marsha, thank you. I appreciate you setting the table. 
Uh, I have a few minutes to talk about bridging the gaps in oral health, and I specifically want to talk about community health workers. You're going to get the slides afterwards, and I don't have a lot of time, but I put extra slides in so that if you were to give this presentation at your organization or to try to persuade someone, steal these. You know, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. So, oh, please move. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, we'll see. Okay, think about it. There. So most people, when they think about Surgeon Generals and oral health, they think about David Satcher, who was the person that did, was behind the 2000 Surgeon Generals report. But the person before him was Everett Koop, pediatrician. And I also don't read my slides. So if there's something up there, you should read them and I'll just talk around them. But these are four comments that Everett Koop actually spoke about and commissioned officers love him because we had to be clean shaven before. He would refuse to shave his beard and he's the head of the commission corps. So we all could grow facial hair. I felt like an adult, it was great. So this is a slide that just shows the prevalence of oral disease. And it's good if you're trying to talk to an audience that doesn't have a lot of familiarity. There's facts on the left, but the pictures tell a good story. Up in the upper right is, we called it baby bowel tooth decay when I was a kid. Now we're more sophisticated, early childhood caries. And it, it's caused by leaving a bottle or a, a child uh, sucking at the breast indiscriminately. You notice those bottom teeth look immaculate. And it's like, why? Because the tongue covers it when they're sucking on a bottle. Those teeth in the lower right hand corner, that's grandma called that uh, tartar, calculus, it's periodontal disease. And we know that if I clean that up, those teeth would fly out of the mouth because that's basically what's holding them in. And the oral pharyngeal cancer that uh, you see here, this person doesn't go to the dentist. And a lot of physicians we're used to looking from lips to uvula and we jump over the middle, but we are doing a really good job at helping educate them. This does not hurt. So unless we brought it up as it grew bigger, people just got used to it. So it's really important that we actually look in people's mouths. So dentists are really good at fixing things. And if I'm, if I'm filling a hole, that's great, but it doesn't address the issue of what caused it. And insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. It just can't be about treatment. It needs to be about prevention and prevention both at the individual and the community level. And we work across the lifespan from pregnant women to our esteemed adults. And it is no coincidence that we have those little arrows on the right-hand side, because if I can lower the disease burden within a pregnant woman, she will be able to uh, kiss on her baby, which I want her to do, but not pass on karyogenic bacteria. And she's also role modeling good behavior. And that little kid is trying to grab the toothbrush out of her mouth and stick it in, her, in his own but it just grows and good things happen. So I do wanna share this. Whatever talk I give, you get to always see my practical goals. And in a rural area, trying to get uh, non-oral health people to participate in, uh, well, non-dental people to participate in promoting oral health, these are really good things to be looking towards, that everyone would have the benefit of fluoride that every pregnant woman will have a healthy mouth, which I just enum uh, enumerated about. I want every kid to enter kindergarten carries free. I'm an Indian Health Service doc in another life. 76% of the kids entering kindergarten on the Navajo didn't have one carries, they had a mouthful. And how can you study when you hurt or you can't get into the dentist? Marsha talked about the importance of federal agencies such as HRSA, which addresses health across a broad spectrum. 
every person with a chronic disease, diabetes, HIV, cardiovascular, stroke, and sure, those may be dotted lines. My professional opinion tells me there is a connection. And this lays the groundwork for uh, the last 10 minutes that I want to talk about. Because when a physician writes their treatment plan for me, if I'm a brittle diabetic, I want them to say in there, address Dr. Geierman's oral health, because we know oral health is integral to overall health. And lastly, every senior will have access to dentures or other replace, or replacement options. In the big picture, and public health is always years and trends, if we do what we start in the beginning with fluoride, addressing pregnant women, helping kids have better mouths, by the time they get to be the grandma, they still have teeth. And why are grandmas our secret weapon? And to help you move forward, what Marsha Brand talked about, grandmas aren't just cute, grandmas vote. And grandmas don't vote for themselves. They vote for their grandkids, for their kids, and then themselves. And with the graying of America, there is a lot of us. And we want oral health benefits in Medicare. Oh, I'm sorry, inner voice. Okay, keep going. So what if someone with community health worker skills had oral health knowledge? That'd be a good thing. Who are community health workers? Frontline health workers, they come from the community, they go back to the community. They have an understanding of the people who live in that community and they address outreach, community education, they counsel, they advocate for their community, they are voices for their community. They do a lot of things. They know about case management and care coordination. They are the eyes, ears, hands, and feet of our medical colleagues. They bridge the community and our health care systems. They understand and convey patient backgrounds. I was one of two white providers in a predominantly African-American uh, community health center. I needed to learn the culture. And sometime when you see me, ask me about kids running off and I'll tell you my embarrassing story. They also know client barriers and how to address them. They improve continuity of care and they alleviate fear. If they understand about oral health, they can help people feel more comfortable. A community health worker once told me, I feel like a pie with a slice missing. Guess what the missing piece was? That's right, oral health. And we've already said there is an oral health relevance in every lifespan. Okay, I have my Christmas tree up in the background and I hear things tingling and that would be chilly, my dachshund investigating. So, if navigators had this kind of information, so not just community health workers, promotoras, community dental health coordinators, doulas, but if they have an idea about oral health. Now I will say, when I went to dental school 150 years ago, I used the word dental and oral health synonymously. I would never do that today. Dental, it's something I do with my fingers. It's a procedure. It's something I use a dental code for to get paid for. That's a really important piece we'll come back to. Oral health is what I want these folks to know. I don't want a community health worker to know how to do a tray setup because if they learn to be a dental assistant, someone will try to make them do that. I, they are more valuable to me out in the community. So the ADA's brand of this tiny, type of community health worker is a community dental health coordinator. They have both oral health and community health worker skills. And we'll talk more about that. They, they learn, besides knowing the basics about oral health, different specialties, what does it mean to have a root canal? Should I be afraid? But they know about motivational interviewing. They know how to ask the right questions and listen. They know how to enroll people in 
And for you, New Jersey has what? Community care, whatever your version of Medicaid is called. And they know the limitations. In Wisconsin, you had to re-enroll for a while every six weeks. It was maddening. Community mapping. They need to know who's there. If I go to New England, I shouldn't be focusing on pediatrics. A lot of old people like me live in New England. There are some kids, but they're the minority. I want to know about ethics and jurish, jurisprudence. And you're going to run into dental societies and, and hygienists and physicians. What is this about? Oh, and that's chilly. He's telling me I have five more minutes before Shay jumps in and says, stop it. So the cool thing about being trained within the community dental health coordinator system, uh, Rio Salado, which is one of the original schools in uh, the Valley of the Sun, Tempe, they added a non-dental uh, curriculum. And it's, it begins with an eight module non-credit intro to oral health and you, they learn the basics. It's pass fail, it's cool. Once you have that requirement done, you can register in the regular CDHC training that dental hygienists and assistants take. It's 11.5 credit hours. At the very end, there are six classes. It takes about six to seven months. There is an internship. And dental assistants who come from FQHCs, let's say, or dental hygienists, it's like, oh, what am I going to talk about? Who am I going to chase down? And it's like, well, who do you like to work with? And it could be pregnant women, Head Start kids, WIC, but they have to get away from the chair. And dental directors and CFOs at FQHCs aren't really interested because they don't get paid when they're away from the chair. The cool thing about the internship project at the end, when you teach your skills, community health workers already are in the field. They already have people they're addressing. And let's just say it's diabetics. So think about if you're a community health worker, all the diabetics that you addressed, they all have A1C levels. Write that down. Don't give away their HIPAA info, but write it down. And add them up for the community. What's the diabetic health within that community? When you go through this training, they don't just hoard the information. Everything they learn they're taking out into the field because they take this training at night and on weekends. They're bringing the oral health knowledge. When it's time for the internship, they actually just go back and look at that list of people and check the A1Cs. Wow, it was an average of 10 before, but by adding oral health in, it's now eight. Whoa, that's an outcome. It's not just a counting measure. Yay. I'm so excited. I also know how to use transitions. I know that was cool. So again, pick the group you want to work with. Don't change. Add oral health to what you're doing. Now, the, dent, the three groups that need you most are the ones that dentists are most scared of. Pregnant women, little kids, older people with comorbidities. None of these are insurmountable. I've learned to work with all of them. They're, it's not brain surgery. You just have to step out. So I want to end and shade. This is my really my ending. There's a way to pay for this. We never mention the word dental. Why? Because I said community health workers are already out in the field and they're doing the work of our medical colleagues. Say I'm a brittle diabetic. I may have to see the internist every week for 15 minutes. What happens the rest of the time? The community health worker from the community comes and kicks my butt. Are you taking your medicine, Steve? Are you eating right? Give me those Twinkies. Exercise. Chase me around the house trying to get the Twinkies. And have you seen the dentist? So they're doing that good work. What if we added oral health into that? And I've already said, we could reduce my A1Cs. I could live longer. What would it mean if there was less diabetic retinopathy, less amputations? That's a return on investment. The cool thing is about 25 states already pay 
to have community health workers out in the field do this work. The community health workers don't bill, but their physicians or healthcare systems do. Think about if that physician, as I said before, writes into my treatment plan, address Dr. Geierman's oral health needs. So as they're grabbing my Twinkies, making me exercise and helping me learn to brush at home and get me into the clinic for cleanings, we are doing something important. This is not just my scheme, though it is, but Lori Norris, the former oral health chief advisor for CMS thought it was a great idea. So I asked Pat Finnerty, who is a uh, comrade in arms with Marsha Brand. He used to be the Virginia Medicaid director, not the dental, the big one, the Medicaid. And I said, this is my scheme, what do you think? And he goes, well, you know, there's like a 2015, 2016 CMS memo that actually already gives indication that that works. So my point to you is this, never mention dental. Because if you mention dental, that's a procedure an oral health professional does with their fingers and there's a CDT code that doesn't right now pay for case management. There are four case management codes, maybe one gets paid for, but not regularly. We know that states will pay for community health workers to address overall health. And the very secret thing out of, if, you're, if New Jersey's Medicaid budget was $100, how much of it is designated for dental? $2 on average. The thing about community health workers, we never mention dental. Shh. So when they re get reimbursed, it comes out of the medical pot. Don't tell Juliana, but that's my scheme. And you heard Marcia say, the community health workers are an important piece of Joe Biden's transition healthcare team's thought. So right now, community health workers and our version, CDHCs, there's over 600 of them, 18 schools, we're in 45 states, but we can do better. Let's put these pieces of the puzzle together and really make a difference in rural oral health. And as Ann Rand said, the question isn't who is going to let me, it's who's going to stop me. And if you heard Jane Grover speak earlier, she's my supervisor, she will attest to this. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Geierman, so much. Um, for, for sharing that that piece and and you towards the end you came exactly to what my my where my thoughts were going is is how do we pay for this so if if um, if half of the states already cover this what about the other 25 and 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 how do we work with some of uh, what Dr. Brand shared in terms of the the techniques that we can use to engage our elected officials and and uh, and folks in, in the agencies how do we take something like community health workers or I'm sure the audience will have some questions about other other areas that, that we should take and, and get that be that policy to be extended to the other half of the country. Well, I would I would recommend that you, I can see her name right here, Natalia Chalmers, the acting CMS chief dental officer is on here. She heard my scheme. She's going to treasure it in her heart. She's going to take it back. She's gonna infiltrate the medical side of the house because there are like 60 to 100 physicians offering recommendations and one dentist. She's gonna find colleagues on that side. Call me, Natalia, we'll scheme together. Dr. Brand, any, thought, any thoughts from you for how to make that happen? Well, I think it's always important to find partners you know, who's who else is interested in doing this work? So can we get um, the folks from NAC? You know, is this something they would get behind? You know, everybody, everyone supports the community health centers. The remarkable thing about uh, expansion of a community health center is that the members of Congress fight over who gets to come cut the ribbon. You know, so like who are partners that are uh, well received across um, a number of di different constituencies and sectors and work with those folks? Thank you. Now, 
I know folks in the audience probably have some questions. Please feel free to either put it into the chat and I can share it with our presenters, or if you want to unmute mute yourself and, and ask it directly, um, please feel free to do that. Um, in the meantime, while you're thinking for a moment, I'll remind you that the Sarah has just posted the surveys in the chat as well. Uh, you need to complete those for your CE credits. There's one for dental and a separate one for medical and public health. So please make sure you, you do that before we end. I, anyway. While you're waiting, Shade, I will, I'll mention one thing. As we think about, or our health professionals, getting other people to help us carry our water, it's a two-way street. We need to, and especially as we work in systems where we have joint health records, women will come and see me, but wouldn't be caught dead seeing the OBGYN. I, I was the biggest referral of pap smears in my clinic. I know how to read a child's immunization record. Moms are notorious. They get the first two, but forget the third of that three shot series early on. I take blood pressures all the time. I'm I'm doing my share to help our medical colleagues reach their outcomes that they're also trying to do. So it is a joint effort. Absolutely, thank you. And, and, and you're right that it, that it works both ways that we, we help uh, both sides to get some of the policies through. I, we don't have any questions in, but I, I had a few other questions just in case we had a shy audience. Um, one thing that Dr. Brand brought up was um, broadband access. Um, and I was recently part of a, a round table discussion with a couple of our, our Congress people about um, rural areas and, and with the increasing use of telemedicine and, and perhaps teledentistry as well, um, that we have so many rural areas where there isn't good broadband access. Any thoughts from either of you on possibilities of, again, legislation to, to move access forward um, or, or other partners that we could pull into that discussion? So one of the things I think that has been powerful about this historic time that we are going through is how it illustrated the challenges that many of our communities have in terms of broadband and access. Um, and so I think that the climate within the Congress um, and is probably pretty receptive because they've been hearing from their own constituents that you know, my, my kids can't get you know, do their schoolwork or I'm trying to work from home and I, I don't have adequate you know, um, internet connectivity. Um, and certainly there are a number of partners here. The USDA is an important partner in this work too. Um, so think sort of across the, the um, government, not just HHS about those opportunities for support. And, and once again, take a look at where the resources come from, take a look at the potential for appropriations and see if we can get additional funding for broadband. So I can answer some of the questions in the chat, Shay. In terms of Lynn Tobin, where she says, community health workers, their employment numbers are very low I actually think that's gonna change. And don't go into a system, hey, I'm here to make your oral health better. No, I'm here to make overall health better. Uh, somebody asked, how do you measure the oral health and overall health improvements in health centers? The numbers are already there. Get away from dental. What are the adverse birth outcomes of pregnant women? Low birth weight, premature birth. How many, how many pregnant women have actually been and seen a dentist? How many have had uh, their basic needs met. How many diabetics have seen a dentist during their time at the health center? And what's the A1C now? What is it later? It's simple. And if you have further questions, write to me and I'll, and I'll answer. And uh, there's a question about how does value-based reimbursement, you know, help the dental branch of community health centers? Well, one, I wouldn't help the dental branch of community health centers. I would help the community health centers because dental is part of addressing oral health with the pediatricians, the community health workers, all of the enabling services. Get, get out of your silo and look at this as an overall thought, not as how are we gonna fix dental? It's like, it's like you'll hear people say, dental has to break even, why? In New Jersey, in, in Illinois, the reimbursement rate for dental for an FQHC might be $100. It barely covers anything. 
If I go 20 miles north into Janesville, Wisconsin, it's 260 for the same service, which tells me in Wisconsin, dental is actually paying for some of the other programs. Luckily in Illinois, the enlightened CEOs realize that having a good oral health program helps all of the programs. So they are willing to support it. And I, if I sound like Pollyanna, I am, but I'm Pollyanna with teeth. So if I could just back us up just a little bit. Um, and we're talking about the data that the um, FQHCs collect. This is an opportunity to engage your primary care association. Um, and talk with them about uh, data sets. And certainly the Health Resources and Services Administration collects has a uniform data set that they collect from all of the FQHCs. So, and it's, it's, it, it's something that can be revised and improved and advanced. And so, you know, if we're not happy with the data that, or we don't find the data adequate that's coming out of FQHCs, there are opportunities to make it better through working with the primary care associations the state primary care offices and working with HRSA's folks who do the informed data set, mm -hmm. UDS. I will, I will just address the question about dental therapy. So ignore the fact that I work at the ADA. Think about whether it's an expanded function dental assistant using hygienist to the top of their ability, whatever it is, I want I want people to be efficient, effective, productive, maintain patient safety, quality of care, and it makes profit. No margin, no mission. So I would just encourage the New Jersey uh, dental hygienists, be, assume as much area of responsibility as you can, but be inclusive of everyone. And, and hopefully you already are, uh, because we don't help each other when it's like, this works, this doesn't, and I'm not going to talk to you. That we have more in common than we have differences. Come to the table and have a conversation and leave your baggage outside the door. Thank you, that was a Caswell Evans, the original editor of the 2000 Surgeon General's report. He loves saying that, and I agree with him. Uh, I would also say, really think about, and if you don't know about it, look at the Action for Dental Health Act that was passed at the end of 2018, because Action for Dental Health are things that, the ADA is really good at saying no to things. Uh, Chile agrees, but, Congress people often say, okay, I agree. We're not going to do that, but what are we going to do? Action for Dental Health says yes. Community water fluoridation, medical dental integration, reducing Medicaid burdens. If you can bring those kind of issues to the fore, then you're actually, you're giving people a leg to stand on. So I just want to say thank you. I appreciate Marsha. I thought your presentation was stellar. And uh, we're going to close out of here in 10 seconds. So this was great. Shade. Hey, thank you. Did this without you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.